Test, test. Yes, and test. Test and test. Test and test. Test and Test, test, test.
morning. How's everyone? This bright and crisp Sunday morning. And I look out and we're not big in numbers, but I'm asking that we make it up by being big and hard and stand on and stand in worship service and and I also ask that you have something to give to the service and mind participating. Okay, and this morning scripture will be coming from Hebrews the 13th chapter verses 5 and 6 and it reads as follows let your conversation be without covetedness and be content with such things as ye have. For he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. So that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. And again, that's Hebrews the 13th chapter verses 5 and 6. And may the Lord add a blessing to the hearer of and most of all, the doer of his word. Let us pray. Father God, first of all, I would just want to say thank you. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your love. And thank you for your love and kindness, Father God. We ask that you would just be with us in the service today that you would just stir us up, Father God, and remind us who we are. Uh, Father, we ask that you would go with those that are uh, heavy-hearted, those that are, are sick, the ones that are, are not here. We just ask that you would let them know that you are with them, Father God. And we also ask that you would go with our pastor as he recovered from surgery and that it would be a speedy and, and painless uh, recovery. We ask that you would just continue to bless Pilgrim Valley and its house. We thank you for our, our uh, associate pastor, Brother Smith, as he stands in, and not only in the pulpit, but also in, in Sunday school. We thank you for the Sunday school that we've been having. And also, our, our Bible study, Father God, we thank you for growing it, Father God. We have seen people boldly pray now, Father God, that it started out with just the ministers and, and the deacons praying, but now the entire body has a prayer for you, Father God, and, and we thank you. We're seeing miracles happen, Father God. We're seeing lives change in that group. We thank you for all the ministries and auxiliaries that you have here at Pilgrim Valley. We just, just, just tip our hat to you, Father God, knowing that you are who you are, Father God. Father, we, we ask that you continue to be with this community. This, this Thanksgiving season, we, we're praying that, that everyone will have something good happen to them and that they, they prayers be answered, Father God. And, and it's Thanksgiving season, and people will be traveling. We ask that you would go with them, give them traveling grace, Father God. And when they return, we pray that their homes will be better than when they left, Father God. Just be with us in this service today, Father God. All these things we ask and pray in the Son, Jesus' name, amen. and welcome to the house of the Lord today. Amen. I know we all have grateful hearts today because God has been so good and he is so good. So we just give him glory. We just lift up our voices to him. We lift up our hands to him. Lord, we just give you all the honor and the praise today. The song today says, Oh, give thanks unto the Lord for he is good. Yes, he is good.
testimonies today that God is good.
accentuates a time of thanksgiving and we should remember it but believer there shouldn't be a single day in your life that is not thanksgiving day there is so many blessings there are so many blessings from the Lord that come to us day by day hour by hour, moment by moment, that bless us with his love. That gratitude ought to be the predominant attitude of our lives. We should need to be reminded, but it, we're human. And consequently, reminders and memorials and other kinds of devices to stir our memories are appropriate because we do and certainly can forget to be grateful. Yes. Last Sunday we sang happy birthday for somebody in November or we acknowledged November birthdays. Well I'm happy to say we missed one. Of course we didn't miss it because it hadn't happened yet. But we had a birthday this week for Pilgrim Valley. My son had his second daughter on Wednesday morning. Yeah. Emory Patience Smith has joined our family. So what a blessing. What a blessing. Good morning, Pilgrim Valley. It's a blessing to see you this morning. Glad you braved the cold, came out to enjoy the blessing of the warmth of the spirit in the assembly of the saints. There's a blessing in it for you. Today we're going to continue in our thoughts from the book of 1 Peter dealing with God's might for our manifold temptations. And in the context of this lesson we'll see some things about which we should definitely give thanks to God. The reasons that he has given life for our lives. That he's made it possible for us to have peace and joy in the middle of pitched battle. In the middle of conflicts within and without. God has provided all we need to have peace and joy in this life and in his kingdom yet to come. And for that, we can certainly give thanks. Last week, we talked about a smooth running soul. Anybody here last week remember any of the thoughts about the smooth running soul that's a vital component to our ability to deal with the manifold temptations that will come our way? Well, loving the brethren, consuming God's word, those are vital truths. But this week we're going to talk about, I want to highlight one verse from 2 Peter, chapter 2, verse 11. We'll deal with some other verses in its context. But for purposes of this morning's message and the text, the focus is going to be on one verse from 2 Peter, chapter 2, and that is verse 11. It's a short verse, but make no mistake. The length of the verse is not an indicator of the depth of its content. This verse is loaded. And we're going to talk about some of what's there today. Peter says this, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. Those are sobering words. And when we 
read these words, we need to focus in on what Peter's trying to communicate to us and how vital the communication that he's bringing to us is to our ability to please God and do what the Lord would have us do in this life. Remember, we're studying in the context of 1 Peter where Peter is telling believers about the fiery trials that are to try them, telling them about the manifold temptations that will test them, that will cause them to experience difficult circumstances. But he's also, from the Lord's inspiration, giving us the keys that we need in order to succeed, in order to win, in order to pass these various tests. And here he uses a metaphor of war. War is perhaps the most unpleasant, undesirable, unbearable, but sometimes necessary human behavior imaginable. I mean, it, you would, nobody in their right mind wants to be in a war. But sometimes war is thrust upon you because of the necessity to protect something more valuable than your own life. And we, brothers and sisters, sitting here in these pews today, are in a war. I'm not talking about a war involving bullets and arrows and swords and tanks. I'm talking about a war that involves your mind, your heart, your soul, your spirit. I'm talking about a war that has eternal implications, not just a little piece of land, not a hill there, not a strategic place on a map, but a war whose consequences have important, important implications for your very life. Millions have died through the centuries in war, small and great, from ancient days to the present. And sadly, humanity's gotten really good at crafting technology for warfare, going from spears and arrows to bombs and missiles, capable now of wiping out hundreds of thousands in just a few moments. The acceleration of our killing prowess is truly remarkable and also probably a significant indicator that our time on this planet may not be as long as many expect. Physical wars arise largely because of the brokenness within human souls caused by sin. A physical fight often begins between two people because at least one of them lost the spiritual battle within their own soul and surrendered to the temptation of a fleshly lust. Somebody looked at what you had and said, I needed more. I wanted more. You won't give it to me, so I'm going to take it. And if I have to hurt you, I will, so give it up. You might fight in return and end up one or two severely injured or worse. Others who just use and see things in their desire that they want to take or want to harm in others. The most important battle that any of us will fight occurs right within our own mind and so, James tells us where these things come from, where warfare comes from. He says in James chapter 4, verse 1, From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence? Even of your lusts that war in your members. You lust and have not. You kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you have not, because you ask not. So war is a part of us, both physically and spiritually. But the most important war is the internal war that takes place in the mind and heart of the believer. If you can win that war, there is no external war that should cause you trepidation and fear. Peter makes an earnest plea in our text verse that we recognize the spiritual warfare our souls face and determine to win those battles. 
and, that, that, and win that war by disarming the enemy that's arrayed against us. He says, I beseech you. Notice he, he opened it up with dearly beloved. I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lust. The complete breadth of this message will make two substantial points. We probably will only be able to address one of them today. But they both come from the internal workings of verse 11. And they are this, these two powerful keys to our victory in spiritual warfare that come from this, this verse. First, if you're going to win a war, especially the spiritual war, you got to pick a side. Okay? You, you're going to have to pick a side. And two, we're going to have to disarm the enemy. And that's a powerful, powerful ability to win a war by disarming your enemy. You see, your enemy's greatest weapon against you is in you. And you can disarm the power of your enemy to impact what goes on inside you. There is no enemy that can overwhelm the soul indwelt by the Spirit of God. When that soul depends on God, trusts God, and obeys God, but first, let's talk about picking a side. That's what we're going to focus on this morning. We've got to pick a side. I mean, hey, we're in war. You, you're in it. You don't have a choice. You're in it. But you can pick a side. Some wars happen, and a nation gets attacked, and sometimes the people who are the de on defense decides, you know, this is too hard to fight, and I don't know that I want to win this. What the other side's bringing may not be that bad. Maybe I'll just join up with them. Or sometimes the invader comes in, and they've got troops working for them, and the troops get in, and the troops start looking around and says, you know what? <laughs> I didn't sign up for this. <laughs> I, I, I don't like the way this is going. I don't like what they got me doing. This is, this is not what I'm for. And they choose to leave the army that they had been a part of, choose to leave that force. force. First they go AWOL, and think about it, and then ultimately they decide to just Go completely rogue. I'm done with you. I'm joining the other side. But at some point, if you're in a war, you got to pick a side. And I'm here to tell you, Christian, you got to pick a side. And this is coming straight from God's word to us, not just from me. Notice how Peter puts it. He says, dearly beloved. You know, the first thing he, he tells us is we got to know who we are. We got to know whose we are. First John tells us, love not the world. This is first John 2 and 15. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. John goes on to say, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. We've got to decide. Who do I love? Whose side am I on? Jesus taught his disciples, Luke 16 and 13, he says, no servant can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. 
If you're in a war, you got to decide. You got to pick a side. Who's, who are you going to fight with? But too many Christians have compromised and basically said, well, you know, I think I want to be like Switzerland. I want to just be neutral. But it won't work like that. Not in an existential war. An existential war is where the existence of one or the other of the combatants is at risk. Somebody will cease to be when this is over. And you can't be neutral in that kind of conflict. And the enemy of your soul has designs to make you not available to God for service. The enemy is in combat to win souls to hell. If you are a believer in Christ Jesus, God wants you to win souls for heaven. We can't be neutral in that conflict. The enemy is looking and says, I'm going to take you out of this battle so that you are either useless to God or beneficial to me. And you know, that's what he wants. He wants you to either be useless to God, to where God cannot use your life to be a blessing to others or share his word. Or he would like for you to just join his team and start recruiting other folks for condemnation. But Christian, make no mistake, you got to pick a side. Peter makes this earnest plea that we recognize the spiritual warfare our souls face and determine to win these battles. Too many believers get too invested in this world and not the kingdom of Christ. We should be as Moses and others described in Hebrews chapter 11 who seek a country whose builder and maker is God. We should not grow enamored with our places, our homes and jobs, our positions or our possessions in this world, that we are more loyal to them than the Savior who gave his life for us. But you know, sadly, that happens. One of Paul's associates in the ministry, working with them for a while, decided that he was done. And Paul, in his writing to Timothy, he told him, he said, Timothy, Demas hath forsaken us. He hath forsaken us. Having loved this present world. He just made up in his mind, I, I'm switching sides. I, I, I like what the world offers me. I like the satisfaction of scratching the itches of my lust. I like the satisfaction of quenching the thirst of my fleshly desires. And that is a choice that we're all called on to make. Will we be like Demas? Or will we instead be like the Apostle Paul who decides, I'm going to fight the good fight. I'm going to fight it until it's over. And he says, even though there are temptations in my life and upon my life, I am going to keep under my body. I'm going to keep it under. I'm going to buffet my body. Beat it black and blue if necessary is what the word buffet means. Buffet and keep it under, lest after I have preached to others, I myself should become cast away. He says, I'm not going to become a traitor. I'm not going to become one who turns against the Lord who has delivered me. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 17, a chapter we'll get to again in, in a subsequent talk, makes this point about the inevitability of this conflict. Paul says, for the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh and these are contrary, <laughs> one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. 
Some people are experiencing a lot of frustration in their Christian life right now. And in part, it's because they hadn't picked a side. They're still looking over here, and they're still looking over there, and they like some of what's there, and they like some of what's there, and they think, well, I'll kind of stay. You can't stay in the middle of a battlefield. You know, in the First World War, they had trench warfare, where the Germans were on one side, and the Americans were on the other, and the French, and, and those who were fighting, and... They had these big trenches, uh, and in the middle, the, the soldiers were largely lined up in the trenches, and out in the middle, they called it no man's land. You get out there, you're going to get shot. Bullets come from one side or the other. That is not a place you can long live. Well, stuck between a spiritual life and a life devoted to your flesh is no man's land. You will get there in, in what Paul calls the carnal life, and you will find yourself utterly frustrated. Until, of course, you just give up and pick a side. And then you'll get a little pleasure from the world for a little while. <laughs> but the wise choice, believe me, is to decide, I'm going with the one that saved me. I know whose side I'm on. I'm on the side of the one who chose me. I'm, I'm on the side of the one who said, I will die in his or her place. I will give my life for you. And we, in gratitude to what he has done for us, says, Lord, I'm going to be on your side. I'm going to be on your side. You know, the Old Testament tells us the powerful story of the ancient prophet Elijah and the prophets of Baal and how the, the prophets of Baal were uh, declaring how they were worshiping Baal and they, they built the big altar. And, of course, Elijah challenged me and says, okay, let's, let's, let's see who's God. Bring out the altar and, and they built up a big wood altar, and they were going to have a burnt offering on it. And Elijah did the same thing, set up an altar, and he says, now, let's see who's God. He says, if Baal's God, you just call down fire from Baal and, and take up that offering. And he says, if the Lord be God, we'll see what happens. And sure enough, the Baal prophets got out there. They were hooping and hollering and dancing and doing everything they could, and nothing happened. Elijah kind of mocked him a little bit. He says, well, well where is he? <laughs> Did, is he asleep? Did he go to the restroom? Uh, Y'all need to get him. And, of course, nothing happened. Nothing happened. And then Elijah called on the Lord. And the Lord sent down fire. And, of course, Elijah, before he did that, he had him pour water all over the wood. <laughs> And then the Lord showed them who was God. And Elijah challenged him, why halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, serve him. And that's the choice we have to make. If we're going to win the spiritual battle, win the spiritual war, stand the tests that are coming our way in the manifold temptations, we got to be clear about whose side we on, we're on and pick it. Well, let's see how we do that. Let's see some things that, that are described right here in verse 11 that give us keys to picking the side and how we manage to do it, how we're able to make that choice. Peter says, dearly beloved, that's a first clue right there. You got to know whose you are. You are the Lord's beloved. We have so much problems in our time now because of people not really understanding that they are loved. People believing that they're not because their parents deserted them. People believing they're not loved because they have gone through hardship or experiencing frustrations of various kinds. 
But God wants you to know you're beloved to him. When Peter says dearly beloved, he's talking about his love for them. But more importantly, he's talking about God's love for them. God loved you enough to send his only begotten son to die in your place. To pay the price you rightfully owed for your sins. But now he pays that price so that you don't have to. You are dearly beloved to God. Remember whose you are. He says in verse 3, going back to 1 Peter 2, if you back up from our text verse at verse 11, go back up to verse 3 and 4. And we'll see right here, Peter tells us whose we are. If so be you have tasted that the Lord is gracious, and indeed he is. As we studied in Sunday school this morning, for by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. None of us can boast about our goodness as a means of our entering the kingdom. It's because God loved us and is gracious. If so be ye have tasted the Lord is gracious, to whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. That's who we came to. We came to Christ. He was the stone that the builder rejected. But we are accepted in him. That's whose we are. Our identity comes from our relationship to God through Christ. Christian, it's so important to understand that. If you need help trying to pick a side, let me tell you, pick the side of the one that's already chosen you. Second point, and there's only three. Remember what you are. You want to pick a side? Remember what you are. Verse 5, 1 Peter 2. He tells us what we are. Ye also, as lively stones. God's made you something special. He, he's picked you. You're his but he's made you a living stone, which are almost a contradiction in terms. I mean, the, the, a stone almost by definition is inanimate. It is something that does not live, does not move by itself. But God, just as he, through Christ, made a special choice to make the one that was rejected the cornerstone, he makes us stones as well, but living. Something that was dead. Something that was hopelessly dead. I mean, if, if you're rock dead, <laughs> I mean, you can't get much deader than a rock. And we, in our trespasses and sins, were stone dead but God has made us living stones now ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ God's made us something special and if we remember that remember what we are, then it shouldn't be that hard to pick our side. Notice also in verses 6, 7, and 8, he highlights more about what we are, showing the connection that I've already alluded to. Wherefore, it is also contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you, therefore, which believe, he is precious, the same is made the head of the corner and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense even to them 
which stumble at the word, being disobedient, for unto they also were appointed. We're distinguished by God from the rest of the world, by our relationship to God in Christ. And just as he lives beyond the resurrection, so shall we and so do we. We have life. And third, we got to remember who we are. So the three, remember whose you are, remember what you are, and remember who you are. Notice verse 9. But you. King James says ye, but that means you. <laughs> but you are a chosen generation. A royal priesthood. And holy nation. A peculiar people. That's who you are. There's a lot that tries to make you seem unspecial and, there, and the world tries to make you special, but only in the world's eyes. The world wants to make you special on the way you look. Oh, dress this way, wear this thing, buy this thing, have this car, do this, do that, and be special. But God has made us special in an eternal way. In a way that is not dependent on our financial ability. A way that is not dependent on our genetic heritage. A way that is not dependent on anything in this world, but is dependent upon God's love and grace and mercy towards us. You are a chosen generation. I'm telling you, when I, when I hear these things, whose I am, what I am, who I am, all because of my relationship to Christ, I tell you, it's getting pretty easy for me to pick a side. I'm starting to understand why Joshua was so convinced that when he went out in front of the people before they began the conquest and there was somebody out there Joshua pulled his sword and said, hey, are you for us? <laughs> are our enemy? And of course the Lord said in response with the angel, he says, I'm the angel of the Lord of hosts. And he figured out, I'm on the right side. <laughs> I'm glad you're on my side. And, of course, Joshua then challenged the people. He says, y'all, you're going to have to pick a side. You may be faithful to the Lord or not, but as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. I'm, Joshua said, I'm picking a side. I've, I've picked my side. I know whose I am. I know what I am. And I know who I am. And armed with that knowledge, you can have a very different spiritual experience in this life. Very different. Peter says, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should shew forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Have you had that experience? Have you had the experience of coming out of the dark into the light by repenting of your sins and turning to the Lord and asking for forgiveness and having his forgiveness come into your heart and the weight of your sins roll away? If you have had that experience, then you, you ought to know which side in this spiritual war. You ought to know that the fleshly lusts that will war against your soul will not deter you from faithfulness to God. But you know if you don't, if you don't,
you're going to be in a pitch battle day by day by day by day against an enemy that will put you under siege. You know, a siege is where you're in something like a fort and the enemy has basically cut off, cut you off from supplies and reinforcements. And they are just attacking you to use up your resources so that you will eventually surrender or die. But Christian, we're not in that, we're not in a condition like that. If you seek and serve the Lord, it doesn't matter how many forces the enemy brings against you, the Lord will always have a sufficient supply. The supply line to you is a supply line that can't be cut unless you turn it off. The reinforcements are there and they will defend and protect as long as you don't turn to the other side. Verse 10, he says, Which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Christian armed with these thoughts from 1 Peter. With that background, Peter telling the believers whose they are, what they are, and who they are. He then, based on that, tells them our text verse, which says, I be Beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims telling us another thing about who we are. We need to have a mentality that says, this is not my home. The term stranger has to do with someone who's a foreigner, someone who is traveling through an area, who is residing temporarily in an area, but they actually have a home someplace else. The pilgrim is the traveler. As strangers and pilgrims, our journey in this world, this is not our home. We're like those who, and, and, as the writer in Hebrews tells us as of Moses, looking for a country whose builder and maker is God. I'm passing through here. I'm not going to dig too deep here. And that's a choice we have to make. That's the mentality we have to have or the enemy will have an advantage. If we get in our minds that we got to keep the stuff we got, we get, need to build bigger barns and put more stuff in it, we need to buy and get more and more, and we'll be like the, in the story Jesus told his disciples of the, the man who did all that, tore his barns down and built more, and then the Lord said, Thou fool. Thou fool. Tonight, your soul is required of you. Jesus warned his disciples when two of them, not of the twelve, but perhaps another follower because it's an individual's unnamed, came to him and says, Lord, my brother won't share with me the inheritance. With the implication, Jesus telling him, he needs to give me my share. Jesus didn't get into the middle of their legal fight. What he told him was, beware of covetousness. For a man's life does not consist in the abundance of the things which he possesses. And then he told him that story. That is still a warning to us who are followers of Christ. That we can find ourselves entrapped into covetousness in this world thinking that our happiness, our peace, our joy, our satisfaction in this life is tied up in what we own or are able to acquire. When instead, we're being urged by Christ and by Peter to have the mentality to walk through this life as strangers and pilgrims. Not to say we can't enjoy blessings from God and even material ones, but we can't, we can't love them we can't love the world because that's enmity with God, John tells us. The love of the world is 
puts us in that place where our, the lust of the flesh and the spirit are contrary to one another and you cannot do the things that you would. But that's not where we want to be, believers. That's not where we want to be. We want to pick a side and say, I'm on the Lord's side. That's the side I want to be on. I'll be satisfied with what the Lord supplies me because he will supply me all I need. He is my shepherd. I shall not want. And I'll war. I'll, I'll fight on his side regardless of what it might seem to cost me in this life. I want to close with an allusion to next message which is the second part of, of notice of the text verse, all we talked about was dearly beloved and strangers and pilgrims. The other half of that verse, we still got to get to. And it is vital, and that is abstaining from fleshly lust. We need to know what that means, and we need to know how to do it. But I'll give you a hint that ends this message in a proper way, uh, an appropriate thought, and gives us food for thought for our next opportunity. Some of you may have heard this before, but there's an old Cherokee parable. And it goes like this. It's called the parable of the two wolves. The young boy came to his grandfather filled with anger that another boy who had done him an injustice, and, he, and he'd, he'd, he'd been wronged. And he went to the old grandfather, and he said, he told him all about it. And uh, uh, the old grandfather said to his grandson, let me tell you a story. I, too, at times have felt a great hate for those who have taken so much, with no sorrow for what they, uh, they, they took it, but they had no sorrow for what they had done. But he says, but hate wears you down. And hate does not hurt your enemy. Hate is like taking poison and wishing your enemy would die. I have struggled with these feelings many times. It is as if there are two wolves inside me. One wolf is good and does no harm. He lives in harmony with all around him and does not take offense when no offense was intended. He will only fight when it is right to do so and in the right way. But the other wolf is full of anger. The littlest thing will set him off. He fights everyone all the time for no reason. He cannot think because his anger and hate are so great. It's helpless anger because his anger will change nothing. Sometimes it's hard to live with these two wolves inside me. Because both of the wolves try to dominate my spirit. And by this time, little boy with wide eyes, he's looking at his grandfather. The boy looked intently, and he asked, which wolf will win? Grandfather? The grandfather smiled and said, the one you feed. The one you feed. You got to pick a side. And abstaining from fleshly lust will give us information about how to feed the right wolf. <laughs> how to put ourselves in that position to win this battle. Because it will bring glory to our Savior. It will show genuine gratitude on our part for the sacrifice made by Christ in our behalf. If we are unwilling to fight this battle, what does it say about our love for the one who gave his life for us? It doesn't commend our love at all. It would show that we are ingrates, truly not grateful for what God has done for us. But if we are truly grateful, we will say, Lord, here I am. Send me. I'm on your side. Father, give me the grace to beat back the enemy in me so that I can take on the enemies that try to destroy my home, try to destroy my family, 
try to destroy the world in which I live in. Please, Lord, give me grace. Please stand. For brethren, following on to have a smooth running soul, you're going to have to win the soul's war. It's, it's a, there's a war that's in us, and we've got to win that war. But to win that war, we've got to pick a side. And coming up, we're going to have to disarm the enemy. And that can be done. That can be done. I'm telling you, it's, it's, it's a wonderful thing to have to fight against an enemy that has been disarmed. Just watch them throwing spit wads at your tanks because they have nothing that can stand against the armaments with which you have been given. And that's the condition of the believer when we understand who we are in Christ. We're more than conquerors through Christ Jesus who lives in us. I ask you today, have you picked a side at any point in your life? Realize that outside of Christ, you don't have life. You've got some time and you've got some pleasures that you've put yourself into, but you don't have anything lasting. You don't have anything that, that you can have when you're alone. You know, people that are empty, they can fill up a little bit when they get around other people and they can laugh and they can have a little fun, but when they get alone and the power's off and the TV won't come on and the internet ain't working and your phone's dead, and you're left with your thoughts and the guilt of your sin, what do you have? Well, I want you to know that when you have Christ Jesus, everything in this world can be stripped from you. You can have your wealth taken. You can have your health taken. You can have your friends taken. You can have your wife taken. You can have all that you have in this world taken. But you can still say, bless you. Be the name of the Lord because you have the life of Christ in you in a relationship with the Heavenly Father that tells you that no matter what happens, you're His and you have an eternal place in His kingdom. And you can fellowship with Him in the dark alone and smile knowing that nobody sees it but you and the Lord. That's a wonderful place to be. But if you don't know the Lord, you want to be around other folks, you want to be around something happening, you want to be involved in things to try to fill that space. Not that there's wrong in being social, but being social is no substitute for being saved. Being saved will make your social times, particularly your social times with other believers, all the more precious and all the more blessed. So I ask you, if you don't know the Lord as your Savior, if you hadn't picked Him as He has picked you, if you haven't received Him by asking for forgiveness, repenting of your sins, don't put it off. Don't put it off beyond this day. Say, Lord, I want to be on your side. Father, thank you. If you're a Christian, have you been in the middle of the battle? Somewhere in the middle, you look on one side and say, boy, that looks real good over there. And then you look back to that and you find yourself in the middle. It's miserable in the middle. Get out of there. Quit being lukewarm. Get hot or quit. But don't just kind of dilly-dally in carnality. Choose the Lord. When you realize whose you are, you realize what you've been made by Him, and you realize who you are in Him, you should be able to pick a side and say, Lord, help me serve you. Honorable and acceptable. Make that choice today. now for the officers to come for this morning's offering.
Brother Browning, if you would, you can begin to make your way up here for our altar prayer. Lord. Praise the Lord. All right, I thought y'all went home already. You left on me early. This is the day the Lord had made. And I don't know about you, but I want to rejoice in it. You get to a certain point in your life where you thank God for everything. I mean, when you're young, you just get up and go on about your business. But when you start getting in your twilights and your dark days in your life, you start thanking God for every day. I'm getting to a point I'm thanking Him for every hour. Because, you know, <laughs> it gets rough. <laughs> it gets rough sometimes. But, you know, God is good. He's gracious. And I thank God for Pilgrim Valley. And I thank God for our teachers. And, you know, our men of God that we have and our women of God we got here that, that can, can break that word down and encourage you through the word. Amen. We thank Sister Pat for this morning, the lesson that reminded us who God is. And then we thank Reverend Smith for reminding, me, reminding us who we are. So it's a, it's a complete package today. Huh? I'm kinda, I'm kinda, I, I feel kind of rough this morning. I, like somebody said, I think Sister Pat said the devil was messing with me this morning. Talking about, Stay here because you ain't feeling that good. You hurt everywhere. I said, Yeah, I do. But when I start feeling like that, and the devil start talking like that, that's when I hurt. I make myself get out of there because I know he's trying to keep me from something good. And he, he would. I would have missed all this today. Amen. Amen. Thank God for, for you guys. You, all. you know, God commanded the church to pray. That's, you know, because we're in a warfare, brothers and sisters. We're in a warfare. And God has given us some weapons to equip us in this war. And prayer is one of them. Prayer is one of our spiritual weapons. That's our knife. That's our gun. That's our cannons. We can't, we can't shoot the devil. We can't shoot spirits. We can't, you know... 
get them inside the head. But we got a prayer. We can juggle them with that prayer. We can juggle them. And they feel that. That's why he comes against prayer so hard. Because when you pray, you, you hurt him. <laughs> you hurt the devil. Amen. And I don't know why, you know, we don't pray every day, all day. Huh? It's almost impossible to do that, but when we get an opportunity, we should jump on the opportunity to pray. Amen. Amen. Whether somebody praying for you or you praying for yourself. So we're going to obey God this morning. We're going to pray a, 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 a blessing upon the church. We're going to pray for those that are not able to pray for themselves right now. And uh, we're going to pray for the world. It's a terrible condition. This is our altar prayer time. Traditionally, we would come down to the altar, but we're going to make the altar wherever you are right there because of circumstances. The altar is right there where you are. You make that an altar wherever, right where you are. That's your altar. And you have some things you you know you believe in God for in your life. You, in your own way, you pray right there where you are for those things you believe God for. And as, as we, when we used to pray for the altar, at the altar, we don't take the stuff back with us when we leave the altar. When you sit down, you leave that, that stuff up there. Don't, don't, don't sit down with it. Amen. Release it. Give it to God. God said he'll carry it. We weren't designed to carry this stuff. Amen. Let's pray. Eternal Spirit, our Heavenly Father, God, we thank you, Lord, for this day. A day you have made and we rejoice and be glad in it. We thank you, Lord, for all you've done for us. Thank you, Lord, that you've been with us from the earliest of our existence, even to this present moment. We recognize now, God, that you have been right by our side. And we thank you, Lord. We thank you for so much. We, we, we don't have enough tongues to thank you for all you've done for us. But we, but we realize that you are, you've done so much for us. We, we understand, God, that you've been with us all through our lives. But, God, we need to, we need to show you our appreciation by not just saying it with our lips, living it with our lives. Being the men and women that you have called us to be in these last and evil days, we thank you, Lord, for your healing virtues that you have available for us. But God, we reach out right now by faith. We reach out into the heavenly realm and we pour those blessings down of healing right now, Lord, and we receive it by faith. We know, we understand, God, that your mercies and your grace is new every day. Every day you got a new grace and you got a new mercy for us. So, God, we just receive it. We receive it. God, it's a free gift. We don't have to work for it. We don't have to do anything for this. God, you make it available for us. All we have to do is ask. You say we have not because we ask not. And then when we ask, sometimes we ask amiss. Keeping it upon ourselves. Thank you, Lord, that you are working with us and you're dealing with us on, on today, God. And we, we are able, Lord, to get out of our own selves and to think about somebody else, God. God, think about others. That's, that's your personality. That's, that's who you are. And as we learn more about you, that we become more like you. And that's what we want to do. We want to be like you, Lord, so we can please you, God, and do the things that you would have us to do. Not through fleshly desires, but through our spiritual understanding, oh God. Through your personality, through who you are, is that's who we are. And we lay down all these flesh in his eyes right now. We lay them down right now at the altar. And we take up, oh God, our spiritual mantle. That we may walk as you would have us to walk. That we may glorify you, God, in this land. 
We pray for those that are not here, that are able to be here. We send, I, we send your word of healing to them, whatever it may be, whatever situation they be, may be in, Lord, we send your word to them. Hallelujah. Some of us right now, Lord, are struggling. We're struggling. We're struggling with relationships. We're struggling with our finances. We're struggling even with our spirituality. Some of us are even questioning who we are and what is our place in this, in this spiritual body. Touch right now. Touch them, Lord. Let them know God as they continue to walk, continue to uh, present themselves before you, Lord, because you will give them the answer. You will hold nothing good from the people that love you, God. And God, we thank you, Lord, that you are bringing back those backsliders, the ones that have turned away from you, God. You are calling them back out of darkness into your marvelous light. Hallelujah. We thank you for our pastor right now. And we again, we pray for his healing right now, Lord. And we know, God, we pray for it over and over again, but we know, God, you're going to heal him. But we... It, it, Nonetheless, Lord, we, we, have to, we have to present it before you. We pray for all those that are here right now present. Give them what they desire right now. Give them what their hearts desire. In your way, in your will, oh God, let it be done in your will and in your way. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And thank you, Lord. standing for our benediction. Many blessings to you this coming week with family and others with whom you will spend time in celebration of the gifts of God to you. As I have been, let's close with the closing that Peter used for his first in 1 Peter chapter 5 verses 10 and 11 but the God of all grace who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus after that you have suffered a while make you perfect establish strengthen settle you. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. And let us all say. Amen.